Alright, today's simple enough. Just the uh, one little package, although if I remember correctly, this is actually pretty notable right now. It's Kaiji. A complete series. And it feels heavy, so there's a uh, two seasons with fifty-two episodes. If I'm remembering right, I think this character does tend to show up on or did tend to show up on lists of anime with um Manly Man alongside Guts. And I got the impression it was maybe not for the same reason as Guts, but I don't know. Ted be curious. I could be mistaken, it could be a different series, but here we are. So let's see. There's a region A. This is Japanese with English subtitles only. This is a stone cold bitch. Okay. If luck is a lady, his luck is stone. Okay. So I see special features here. It's just opening, clean opening and ending. Blah 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 blah. Okay. So Sentai Filmworks released this. I was kind of wondering. Just one, just two, just three, just four, just five, and not disc nine, this is disc six. That's pretty quick. Uh, I mentioned this month was a pretty light month, so fortunately we've had something every day for it, so, you know, even though I've only gotten the one here for this week's anime DVD collection update. At least there's something. So, I don't think there's much to talk about either. Um, so, with my Friday friend I watched more Gate. I guess it's interesting because... I'm not sure if I've talked about potential weak points of Gate. But it is kind of interesting how some of the stuff I've described in there I kind of know is not like the strongest parts of the series. But... Like, there's a part where some of the characters from the special region come through to Japan, and some of the behaviors of some of the other countries is just simply comic book villain. It's, and it, it's really kind of a notable thing about the show, where sometimes the show doesn't have very deep characters. Like, it's like, eh, we need the United States to be acting bad, so they not only have them, they just have it where they're not really acting like real people would act. I mean, you've got very bad people in politics for sure, but this is so much closer to, ha ha ha, I think myself the villain. And, and that's the real problem. And, you know, it's not like the United States is the only country acting bad in there, but just sort of like, okay, is they're going to go and they're going to, kidnap people from the special region, that gun boy? What the fuck are they expecting to do with that? They're not going to leave a very good impression. Are they going to take them and hold them hostage? That's just going to make those countries look bad. Maybe people won't know. Well, okay. The best they could really hope to gain out of that is maybe they actually learn magic from the magician girl? But, you know, it, it, none of that really strikes me as, okay, they're definitely going to have a, um, you know, it doesn't strike me as just a good way to kind of get other countries' politics involved in the special region. And it's interesting because it's not like that's the only time when this show is like that, but I think it kind of works because despite all that stuff, there's kind of just really interesting things it experiences. And then Sometime within that shallowness, there's actually great, like uh, the endeavors of Princess Pina Colada. One of the reasons I really like the show, especially early on, is her oh shit moments, where she just kind of realizes just what she's up against, and just when you empathize with that feeling, you're like, okay, even for the kind of character she is, where somehow she's this stereotypical knight type person, you know, she's going through this revelation, which is just kind of really, you know, 
great because, you know, at the same time, the show's also trying to pat itself on the back with how civilized the JSDF. I think last week I talked a little bit about how it was maybe interesting that the Japanese army would actually be in a really interesting place for doing a lot of this stuff because, you know, they wouldn't have the true terrors of war because, um... So I say because they're umbrellaed by the U.S. Army in theory, and that's only part of it. There's also the part where... Um, so basically, they don't have to worry about building their own nukes because the U.S. will nuke for them in theory, I guess. Um, and most people aren't going to be targeting them again with nukes, so they're not usually worried about stuff like that and building stuff up like that. And then other things of war mean, you know, they don't have to build chemical weapons or weapons of mass genocide or something like that. But I don't think a protective umbrella is a very complete correct description of it, but it is kind of one function that's been there, where Japan doesn't have to go out and fight the rest of the world for valuable resources, especially like the way it needed to during um, World War II, as far as I understand things. But, you know, at the same time, you know, call calling the United States an umbrella, it's like, it's a very positive way to kind of look at it, but at the same time, you know, it's also kind of held them back from building up and exploring their own military, and, you know, it, maybe it's no different than them also being an occupied nation to a small degree. Like, it's not like there's armies and they're telling people to go to bed at night, uh, military curfews or anything like that. So, you know, it's kind of weird. You can kind of think of it a couple of different ways, which kind of means it's probably really a mix of both. But the point is... That would mean that they're in a position where they don't have to be, like, this really aggressively designed military force. And so, that makes me think that the them being able to be civilized in the other region eh, might make some sense. Give or take the fact that, you know, I, these are all impressions. Not only have I never lived in Japan, I've never been in the military here in the States or in Japan, and, you know... At best, you could say that I, I've got very shallow layman impressions. So, you know, keep all of that in mind with all this and these thoughts. And, you know, there's always the way history's been presented to me that could be influencing one decision one way or the other. And I don't remember where it all came from. But it's just kind of interesting because, you know, it's kind of underplays how much conniving this would probably actually be present when a lot of the Japanese military and political structure acts very valiantly. And, you know, it's really nice to see them acting valiantly, and it's also kind of unrealistic, but it's kind of whatever because it kind of reminds me a little bit about Star Trek, where sometimes Star Trek can be very... And I'm not talking about the newer stuff, because it sounds like with the newer stuff, they... Um, have completely gone as far away from Gene Roddenberry's vision as they could get. Not that I thought that Gene Roddenberry stuff was good, but it was a great starting point, and I think some really good stuff evolved out of that. And I have different thoughts about the way people decided to interject too much of our own personal interpretation of cultures in there, because I, I think people came became a little too invested in making the Star Trek universe evolve in a way that would be pleasing to people who wanted to get their political hard-ons as opposed to trying to actually explore some ideas of utilitarian society. Now, at the same time, you know, that was also a problem. But I guess the point is, to a certain degree, especially when you go to older Star Trek, I don't know if the next gen or if the original series did this, or maybe if this is just my grew up on next generation mindset, but there did tend to be this thing where there was a kind of utopian people are trying to achieve their ideals, give or take the fact that sometimes they treated Wesley like shit and sometimes because he deserved it, because he was um, a Gary Stu by most interpretations. Nah, nah, I think I agree with the interpretations. The laws of the universe kind of bent their will towards him. Uh, so, um, you know, putting all that aside, you know, that's an interesting comparison where it's like, okay, well, we could see wanting the presence of some of this military stuff and idealize some of how should they behave. And it's not like they behave completely 100% well, and it's not like there aren't conniving members like the Diet member, but again, she ends up being kind of 
this nobody who was like, uh, it didn't sound like she had political power, it just sounded like she had a big fucking mouth and a lot of fucking assumptions and I don't know. Which is unfortunately very real because I've been kind of introduced to some people in politics that are very much like that. But I'm not going to say who that is so that we don't have to have that debate about it. We just know that you're going to have people who definitely aren't really thinking about things. They've got a preconceived notion of the way things should be and they just absolutely have to push that no matter what. No matter which side of the political spectrum you're on. You've seen somebody on... Well... Hopefully you've seen people on both sides doing it, but you've definitely seen people on the other side that does it as well. And, you know, I guess, I guess it's interesting because that statement about the Japanese government being just is kind of a little off there, considering there was that member of the Diet that was, um, you know, she was born with, um... This was a joke I was making, but it occurred to me that it wasn't about her. Like, there, there's the, um the slightly smaller brown-haired close quarters combat specialist on the main team and you know especially with the episodes we watched it becomes really obvious that she really was just born with two dominant bitch genes she's not a good person now she's with our main characters and she's not an immoral person she's just the kind of person that would call, call somebody a jackass even though you know she should be realizing that she's the one being a presumptive bitch and it gets even worse the more she learns about how secretly awesome this guy she was always bad mathing really is. Um, that seems to be just more of an excuse for her to just believe he's more of a jackass and to insult people who don't deserve to be insulted, like the guy's ex-wife. Which is just, you know... And she's actually kind of a fun character to still have around, but she really just needed to have her reality kind of beaten to her face a little bit more, I guess. You know, like, shows like, um... Problem children are coming from another world, aren't they? Are kind of fun because you do have these people who kind of think they have this notion of the way reality is and the way it should be. And problem children from a, are coming from another world is fun because it kind of begins with people who begin with that narrative that you've maybe seen in a couple of other shows. And then it's just like, nope, table flip. Actually, there was a little tab table flip in the first episode, wasn't there? No, 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 no. It was a table slam to... Yeah, that one was pretty crazy. So, um, yeah, the point is, you know, that one's funny because Black Rabbit just has this preconceived notion of everything the way it's supposed to be, the way the narrative's supposed to be, or something, and our main characters are all strong enough that it doesn't matter. And one of the problems with the show is it kind of is like, oh, we made them too strong, so we kind of have to weaken them a little bit, but it didn't really need to. It, it did a good job of keeping up the pace for a surprisingly good amount of time, given that how overpowered it made its characters. And it had its moments, but then it just kind of lost steam, because, like, you know, can't keep having them steamroll everything, even though they really have to figure out ways to make them steamroll everything, because that's what made it fun. But, I digress. Um, it, it's all thoughts, streams of thoughts, talking stuff, somehow, and actually it's no surprise I went from talking about Gates to vague political ideas, because, you know, some of, some of this is about the politics, and it's not even necessarily politics from our world. It's also somewhat about the politics of uh, these medieval fantasy worlds that um, people might go to in these various isekai shows, and, you know, fun stuff. I keep saying, you know, like it makes a difference. Uh, da, 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 da. So I ended up not watching anything else. It just seemed like almost every single day there was some Monster Hunter to do. A little for my own sake. Um, I, guess, I guess the issue is there's like three different peer groups that are playing at the moment. And I, I say peer groups like they're big groups, but the truth of the matter is you got one big group, which is the group I play with on Tuesday, but they also get together for their own things on some of the other days, and I definitely wanted to join and help them because, you know, as Tuesday is kind of my main day, that means that the people I mainly group game with are getting higher and higher rank and getting close to me, and maybe one of these Tuesdays we'll see something where I'm not just being a, oh, I'm helping people. It might also be interesting because I'm getting better at figuring out some of the paths I like um, in these areas.
but I'm, I'm not sure that I'm really done figuring all of those out. So, if you don't know what I mean by path, so, if you have not played Monster Hunter Rise, um, there are two things that kind of encourage you to explore the map um, before you engage in the first monster. So, before, th things of that nature would be that, oh, well, I need to get a couple more of blank item. And usually, you reach a point in the game where you're farming blank item instead of actually going out and collecting it so that you can continue going out to hunt monsters and the farmed items are just helping you construct the items you need in order to keep doing that. Various traps and bombs and all that stuff. Um, so there's a couple things Monster Hunter, Monster Hunter Rise does different. One of those is the optional subquests. Maybe it wasn't called a subquest. It could just be an optional quest. Where basically you're supposed to go and grab seven plants or five account items or fight two high rank monsters or something like that. And so there's some encouragement for you to go do that. But even if you put that aside, that's something that sometimes you can just do in the background. And every once in a while you're like, yeah, I should probably be making more progress on that because I have too many armor spheres in general, period. But, um, you know, you put that aside. And sometimes you're just. Okay, um, what you actually need to do is you need to at least gather some spear birds. Those are those um, chirpy things that you keep running into that are like four different colors. The advantages of that is you have a little pouch that kind of maintains the permanent buffs. And these are so-called perma buffers. And you know that basically means that you can make your attack be slightly higher than it really should be. And or would be without it and all that stuff. So there's some good reason to go and get some of that stuff so that your character's a little more hardy and, you know, able to just duke it out in battle. And then the other thing is the hunting helpers, where one of the neat things about Monster Hunter Rise is just this idea that the hunter is really just more in tune with nature in general. That's why when you're playing on your own, you have two companions, and they're going to be a dog and a palico, or dog and cat, or feline and a canine. So they are called feline and canine. Okay, and they're spelled weird. But they're also called Palicos and Palamutes, which I guess are the trained versions of those. And if you're not, you're just going to have one of them. But you also have a Kahoot, which is an owl. And the owl is conceptually how your character kind of understands how to do stuff. You have temporary stuff that can heal you or boost a stat uh, temporarily. You've got the spear birds, you've got the gold bugs, and you've got the other things that you would pick up that are, create a temporary healing effect over a period of time, or... Um, make monsters target you, or put them to sleep, or give them um, the various elemental um, debuffs. There was a, diff a different word for them, but like the electric debuff, which causes them to um, become stumbled more easily, or paralyzed, or something. No, probably not paralyzed, but. You know, there's a lot of life forms that really help you out here. And, of course, your hunter uses wire bugs and great wire bugs to maneuver around the map uh, just a whole lot more. So, you know, there's a whole lot of... They just get used to using a bunch of different things. And the hunting helpers are just kind of interesting because sometimes they're just really nice to just kind of throw the monster off of its base or get, take more control over it. So, you know, instead of constructing dung bombs, which are really easy to construct now, um, you could um, get trap bugs and lay trap bugs on the ground. The monster step on them and say, "Ow, I'm leaving. I don't want to deal with it." You can find a puppet spider to make it easier for you to mount a monster, so you can crash it into a wall a couple of times, or make it fight another big monster, which is fun. Uh, you know, you can use the stink bug or the whale nard to kind of change where monsters are, so that you encourage infighting, and infighting leads to usually one monster becoming mountable and then you make the monsters fight each other so you get more shinies and then crash into the other monster to switch that one to rideable and do that again just litter the ground with all the shiny stuff um you know there's lots of little fun things and you know coming up with good paths means you basically come up with a path which gets you pretty much most of the spear birds you need maybe you could be like me, and you're not exact, but you're like, well, I picked those up, and I managed to pick up um, this handful of hunting helpers along the way, which I really like. 
and then maybe along the way get your optional sun quest and then find your way to the main monster you're hunting and do it and you know I think there's degrees of how much you might do that especially since not everybody's going to be trying to buff the same things I went with a very attack heavy set and that's mostly because when I'm given nothing else to focus on I'm like well if I can't do this, this, or this, then I'm probably just going to try to raise my attack. And so, I've tried to raise my attack, and it's a pretty good set that I got together. It's not any one specific set, it's just a mix of stuff with the general theming going on, and that raises attack and a critical eye, which is my an increase to crit chance. And I'm starting to build up part breaker, so, you know, parts of monsters break faster. It's cool fun stuff. Why was I talking about this in relation to Monster Hunter? I don't know. I guess because I started thinking more about what paths I was actually taking, what sort of stuff did I want to pick up for sure, and succeeding, I guess, at finding paths that I was generally satisfied with. I think I've got some playing around with to do, but... Hmm. There's only the five maps to figure paths out on, so it's not too bad. Oh well, Monster Hunter is still fun. The main problem is just so tired. Um, and I am continuing to do Animal Crossing. I think I've been talking about that because what happened was I had a UK friend who wanted um, some colored flowers because I focused on making sure I bred every single type of flower in my second island, and I kept my second island when I was first playing with my first game, I kept the second island in an intentionally under evolved state because it was more utilistically useful to my first game if I could just go there and sell stuff when I was playing late at night at midnight, for example, when the shops normally closed. You know, I could just go to the other island and sell stuff. I could go to either island and sell fruit from the main island on the other one just to, you know, sell the special fruits at a better price. Um, but then eventually I reached a point where I, my island is five stars, it's fully developed, I like where it's at on my primary game, so the second one's just like, oh, I might as well start advancing it. And I took that seven month break and then, you know, the UK friend wanted the flowers and then I'm back there I'm like, oh yeah, I was in the middle of doing all this stuff, so. And I think I mentioned that I did unlock terraforming like a couple weeks ago and stuff and I've been slowly building stuff up and I think tomorrow morning is when all the buildings are finally in their planned location. I had to swap two of them because of space concerns, but it still worked out okay. You know, it's less than ideal for what I wanted, but the idea is the main buildings are still lined up in two locations. One's houses and the other's um, util island utility things, so like town hall and museum. I, th I think it's a light layout that's probably been seen before in general. Um, but, you know, I've also filled out, okay, here's where the different fishing options will exist. So if, you know, it's still, I've got a northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. So if I want to go to the southern hemisphere and fish for stuff, well, now I have all those options. I probably have to do bait because I didn't set it up to generate a whole lot of fish and necessarily rivers and ponds and on-cliff rivers. But... You know, it's all there. It's fine. It's <clears throat> good. It's just that my mom also wanted some colored flowers as well, so, you know, I've, I've got to replenish the stock. Not that it has a lot of stock, but, you know, eh, I keep saying you know a lot. I guess it just indicates how tired I am right now. So Animal Crossing has been eating plenty of time. And I don't feel it's, like, bad for doing it. It's just you know, the way it is. Hmm. I wonder how that's going to turn out. Don't know. Because the one thing I haven't figured out yet is if on my second island I'm going to furnish the house or how I'm going to go about doing that or decide what I'm going to do with that. Because there's... It, it hasn't really needed furnishing. And... It's not quite as important as that. But I guess if the island ever reaches five stars, then the house might as well reach S rank. Or I should at least consider that. Hmm. 
Maybe I, I only need to get a little close to the things to think about. All right. I guess I'm, I feel like I'm at the mumbly phase where I'm not sure if what I'm talking about is all that relevant anymore. All right. So y'all take care and have a nice week.